Welcome to part three of the 2023 East Bay Leadership Series presented by Kaiser Permanente. And happy Passover. If you're hearing the sounds of construction equipment rubbling behind me, don't be alarmed. Um, I like to say that's just the sound of economic vitality and East Bay Mud doing very important work um, here in Walnut Creek. Um, my name is Mark Orcutt, and I'm honored to serve as the president and CEO of the East Bay Leadership Council. Today's program is an opportunity to hear from and engage with a, a leader in the movement to end chronic homelessness. Roseanne Haggerty and her team at Community Solutions are making a measurable difference on complex and com on a complex and compounding issue. And I look forward to the conversation and I'm thankful you joined us. I also wanted to tell you, spend a moment telling you more about us and what we do at the East Bay Leadership Council. The EBLC is a nonprofit organization representing hundreds of employers across Contra Costa and Alameda counties. Those employers include everything from small nonprofits serving at-risk youth to multinational corporations that employ thousands locally. Our mission is to increase economic vitality and quality of life for the region. It's a big task, and we address a wide range of issues to advance our mission. Some of those issues include workforce shortages, the energy future, transportation funding, and of course, the housing affordability crisis. We advance our mission through direct advocacy on those issues at all levels of government. We host events like today that I hope inspire, educate, and connect business and community leaders alike. We lead programs that expand our impact in the community, like our Build the Bench candidate training program, and a nonprofit board match called Engage East Bay. We're very proud of this work. And I want to take a moment to highlight Build the Bench as we continue our efforts to fill a full class for 2023. We started the program five years ago with a vision for helping community leaders learn more about what it takes to run a winning campaign for public office. We take pride in the fact that more than a dozen alumni, alumni have served in office since the program's funding. So if you're interested in running for office or know someone who is, please head to buildthebench.com. We'll drop a link in the chat shortly. And if you don't already receive EBLC's newsletter, let's fix that. We share updates on our work, highlight opportunities to engage, and feature must-read news for East Bay leaders. QR code is on the screen, so you know what to do with that. And while you're subscribing to our newsletter, I want to take a moment to highlight today's moderator, Lindy Johnson. In addition to being EBLC's brilliant policy director with more than a decade of experience in public and nonprofit sectors. Lindy is the immediate past chair of the Contra Costa Council on Homelessness. Lindy holds a BA from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and a master's in public administration from CSU Dominguez Hills. Her policy expertise and inquisitive approach to solving Deeply intense problems are an incredible asset to our team, make her an outstanding colleague, and will make her an exceptional moderator this afternoon. And I'm sure you've all subscribed by now or are doing that. So um, I just wanted to pause. I'm, I'm done with my remarks. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce EBLC's board chair and the president of Graybo and Scott to continue our event. Take it away, Leah. Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to help the East Bay leadership uh, as board chair in this current fiscal year. Uh, we are making, as Mark has uh, mentioned here, a difference on public policy, building coalitions uh, that help shape the future of the East Bay. And while I am a pr I'm proud to be the uh, board chair, I am also proud to be a dad, a, a husband, a pastor, and president of Graybo and Scott, uh, a company that uh, helps turn transportation visions into reality. And it's also, I think, valuable for me to recognize that none of those are possible without the help of others. And so I am grateful to the teams that make all of those roles possible for me. And it's, uh, it's with that that I want to uh, thank a number of people, a number of teams, actually, that make this event possible. So please help me celebrate uh, the various sponsors and contributors uh, with the emoji round of applause. Certainly one of the council's strengths has always been our diverse membership of businesses, and that diversity is certainly evident among our sponsors. Kaiser, as our presenting sponsor, 
is at the forefront of our sponsorship team. Led by the council's vice chair of events, Deneen Wolford, Kaiser has recognized the important way that this leadership series drives critical community conversations forward. This support strengthens, uh, is strengthened by Kaiser's $400 million commitment to addressing housing stability. They understand as we do that health and housing go hand in hand. Thank you, Kaiser. I'm also grateful to our three major sponsors, Asset Mark with leadership from Ted Angus, Chevron with leadership from Lindsey Crane, and the Martinez Refining Company with leadership from Ann Notarangelo. Our sustaining sponsors are John Muir Health with leadership from past chair Sharon Casada Jenkins, Marathon Martinez Renewable Fuels with leadership from Nicole Carranza, and Safeway with leadership from our vice chair of communications, Wendy Gutschall. Our contributing sponsors are Sunset Development, Contra Costa Association of Realtors, Contra Costa Water District, CSAA Insurance Group, My Own Graybo and Scott, Hanson Bridget, IBEW Local 302, Miller Star Regalia, Phillips 66, Republic Services, St. Mary's College of California, Sutter Health, Wells Fargo, and the Workforce Development Board of Contra Costa County. For members of our board who want to contribute as individuals, we have a special uh, community opportunity, our community leader sponsorship. Their names are on your screen and included in today's digital event program. Thank you to all of my colleagues on the board for their generous support. If you are interested in helping shape the 2024 leadership series, next year series, we hope you will consider sponsoring. A QR code is on the screen for more information. Early sponsorship commitments are key to the series success and to our lining up of exceptional speakers as we have uh, presented to you this year. Finally, it is my time to recognize and thank all of our elected leaders in attendance this afternoon. Uh, the names of, of them are on the screen and we are grateful for your continued commitment to advancing an equitable and thriving East Bay economy by serving us as elected officials. With that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the Chief Nurse Executive for Kaiser Permanente's Walnut Creek Medical Center, Ruche Holman. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ruche Holman, Chief Nurse Executive for the Kaiser Permanente Diablo Service Area. Where we live has a big impact on our, our overall health and well being. Kaiser Permanente's vision is that everyone has a safe and stable place to call home. Without this, it's nearly impossible to live a healthy lifestyle. Access to affordable housing is essential. Otherwise, individuals cannot focus on basic health and medical needs. And for those experiencing chronic homelessness and people who are severely rent burdened, illness and mortality rates are far greater than the general population. Healthy homes uplift healthy families, and healthy families uplift healthy communities, contributing to a society where everyone can truly thrive. Kaiser Permanente is committed to supporting housing to improve health. We're leading efforts to end homelessness and preserve affordable housing by making strategic impact investments shaping policy and catalyzing innovative partnerships. Our National Housing for Health initiative is focused on increasing the affordable housing supply, strengthening homeless response systems, and transforming care and preventing homelessness. And right here in our own backyard, we've partnered with Habitat for Humanity to build 42 homes in Walnut Creek. We must work together to address these issues through a multi-year strategic partnership, Kaiser Permanente is working with community solutions to reduce homelessness across 32 Kaiser Permanente communities. Roseanne Haggerty is the president and CEO of Community Solutions, and we are thrilled to have her join us today. Roseanne is an internationally recognized leader in developing innovative strategies to end homelessness and strengthen communities. 
Community Solutions assists communities throughout the U.S. and internationally in solving the complex housing problem facing their most vulnerable residents. Their large-scale initiatives include the 100,000 Homes and Built for Zero campaigns to end chronic and veteran homelessness and neighborhood partnerships that bring together residents and institutions to change the conditions that produce homelessness. She previously founded Common Ground Community, a pioneer in the design and development of supportive housing and research-based practices that end homelessness. So please join me in welcoming Roseanne Haggerty. Well, thank you, Roche. And uh, our partnership with Kaiser Permanente has been truly transformational. And you'll hear, uh, as I describe our work, uh, the ways in which uh, our, our organizations and frankly, uh, a growing number of uh, business and civic organizations and community partners across the country are showing that homelessness is solvable. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be with you. I, I do uh, feel that um, uh, organizations like yours have uh, a particularly important role to play in this issue as uh, we learn what actually is needed to drive homelessness to an end state we've come to call functional zero, which is a, a measure of homelessness across a community being rare overall, quickly detected when there's a new housing crisis and quickly and uh, effectively and, and uh, uh, permanently resolved that this requires everyone working together in a new way. Uh, and, 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 and in part, you know, imagine how your community came together uh, at, at, at times with wildfires, other natural disasters during the pandemic. It's that um, you know, we, we kind of come together to keep everyone safe. We adjust what we do uh, against the goal of keeping everyone safe. We pay attention to how an issue is moving and changing and adjust our strategy accordingly. And that kind of uh, all-in command center, iterative learning approach with a, a, a just a, a, a locked-in commitment to a shared aim of no one experiencing homelessness. That's what uh, the Built for Zero movement is about. And so uh, I'll, I'll start by just describing Community Solutions. We're a national not-for-profit now working in over 100 communities to help them uh, demonstrate uh, how to reach a lasting end to homelessness that leaves no one behind. And our aim over the next now four years, we're uh, about a year and a half into our current strategic plan, is to help the country get to a tipping point uh, of seeing this as an urgent and solvable public health and racial equity issue. And to have demonstrated in a wide array of communities of every type, uh, of every type of geography, politics, uh, 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 north, south, east, west, uh, coastal, mid, uh, 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 middle of the country, that any community can actually be on the path to measurably reducing and ending homelessness. And so uh, these proof points are what we're focused on, as well as the policy work and some of the innovative housing work that will uh, demonstrate what the full package looks like. But let me begin with maybe just frankly where we are uh, 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 now, uh, seven years into the Built for Zero movement. And Meg, if you could advance the slide. So as I mentioned, uh, we're working in now 105 communities, which would be defined as a continuum of care. Uh, so a city, county, region, uh, however uh, that, that organization has constituted itself. And for those of you unfamiliar with the term, it's uh, the way HUD, uh, the Department, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development designates geographies and uh, distributes funds for the homeless. So we're working with over a quarter of the uh, uh, COCs in the country. And while uh, it's at the end of the day, it's all about getting people into a safe situation and more than 158,000 people have been moved into uh, permanent housing uh, through the efforts of these particular yeah. communities. Uh, keep your eye on this number, which is really kind of breathtaking, which is 14 communities in the country have ended to this functional zero measure, chronic and or veteran homelessness. And so we have growing evidence of what it looks like to actually be on the path to solutions to this problem and not simply reactions. And uh, one of the things, and I'll go into more detail, is uh, just the, the key pivot point is when communities can get to a point where they know in real time, accurately and comprehensively across the community, who is experiencing homelessness. Because one of the, the key insights that's driven this learning project that uh, is one way of thinking about Built for Zero 
is that if you don't understand uh, in your community how the dynamics of this issue work, and you're you're thinking you're you're trying to solve a problem that you have just a vague hint of, and you did a general count last year, that that's no way to solve a dynamic problem. You need information and a way of responding and getting ahead of the issue that is dynamic is as dynamic as the problem itself. And uh, also, uh, uh, what we find is that once communities get to that point in 64 are now there where they have this binding real-time data and can see the picture whole and how homelessness is moving and changing and the opportunities to intervene in powerful ways to make significant reductions. Um, but that is the key to working in this new manner. And uh, uh, against that uh, uh, yeah, a group of communities, now fifth, uh, another 44 in addition to the 14th most wow. ended homelessness for population. 44 are measurably reduced. So it's a story of progress that I don't think is often heard these days when very truthfully, homelessness is in the news and in a more prominent way, I'd say even probably since the 1980s when the problem first emerged in very visible ways in cities. And uh, I think the, 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 the need to understand that there is a path to solutions is one of the ways in which your organization can, can um, really be uh, opening doors to the, the shift of mindset and practice that's needed to make progress. So let me walk you through how we learned our way into this and what is different in the communities that are getting these results. And uh, then we look forward to uh, uh, questions and uh, going into more detail. But Meg, if you could advance the slide, please. So just to tell you about our journey, which is I think a, a way of really understanding almost the, the country's evolving understanding about this issue. Uh, we began our work, uh, gosh, uh, about 30 years ago uh, as uh, not-for-profit developers of affordable and supportive housing. Uh, we worked in and around New York City. Uh, we were you know, uh, some of the early movers in demonstrating how you built supportive housing and blended different financing uh, sources and integrated uh, support services for uh, those uh, residents who needed them. And we built about 3,000 units of housing, all like incredibly important and very uh, transformational housing for those individuals who happen to move in. But the more we you know, built, you know, we were still seeing homelessness increasing around us. And it was this increasing realization that actually no one had, had the, the, the ball on that. Like we, all, we had so many different organizations in New York still do, all doing very good work but there was almost no relationship between you know, new programs opening and any decrease in homelessness. And in fact, no one could tell you how many people were experiencing homelessness, what was working, what wasn't. And if you could, um, these are some of the, the buildings we built and just you know, housing and more housing is absolutely part of what the country has to, to uh, uh, commit to. But we realized that there was another dimension to this issue that uh, we were seeing, but not grasping which was that fragmentation of like, we had one role to play as a, a housing developer. Other organizations were you know, doing uh, important uh, service provision. The city, the state, you know, the federal government all had policies, but nothing was actually coordinated or adding up. And if you could uh, uh, go to the next slide, Meg. What we found, and it took us actually going out to the streets of Times Square in Midtown Manhattan and just patiently spending time with, I think it was over 127 people that we interviewed at length about why they were having struggles connecting to housing like ours that had been built for people experiencing homelessness. And what we learned from these individuals was, you know, just the, the despair of trying to navigate a completely uh, a disconnected system. And the stories were so consistent that we started pulling together the organizations working in the neighborhood with individuals uh, experiencing homelessness and actually trying to map out like everybody in a huddle, all the different organizations, like what the requirements were, who was responsible for what, you know, where money had to change hands, where a contract needed to be signed, where, where permission had to be granted. Well, this exercise was perhaps the most important of my working life because it really demonstrated that for all of our good intentions, there was no system in place that actually delivered results and that we had uh, inadvertently with all of our different uh, program requirements and funding goals and eligibility criteria, 
we had built this impossible uh, system that no one in the state of homelessness, overwhelmed, uh, despairing, you know, ill, could possibly hope to navigate. In fact, uh, it was, it was, you would just get to get blocked at every turn. And this realization began, a, a, frankly, a new journey for us. And, and we created a new national organization to lean into what was, we came to see true everywhere. And Meg, if you could go to the next slide. That in every system, there are so many different organizations, so many different actors uh, you know, it, it, that, that it, without a shared aim, without a, a, a collective approach, that uh, anyone who has fallen through the safety net that is experiencing homelessness has to negotiate this system that is, is actually, you know, it, it, no one's fault, but entirely broken. And so we, we came to see that this was the challenge, that we could be building housing and, you know, high quality housing and wonderful programs. And there was no guarantee that it would ever get to people who needed it the most, nor was there any, anyone in any community we encountered at that point that actually had any kind of coordinated system that was aimed at getting to the place we all want, which is fewer people experiencing homelessness. And so Meg, if you could turn to the next slide, we formed Community Solutions and began this work of, that's evolved into Built for Zero around basically a new set of questions, not like how many programs do we need or how much housing should we build, but are all of our programs and investments adding up to the thing we want, which is equitable reductions in homelessness over time, knowing that this wouldn't happen overnight. And also how could communities build the capability of actually knowing what was working and, and where it was time and uh, essential to uh, actually uh, uh, have a new strategy. And so this has been the Built for Zero journey. And so let's go to the next slide, please. What we've learned uh, is that there are five things that communities need to have in place for them to actually be operating toward reducing and ending homelessness in a, and, and to build a system that's coherent, that delivers results. Uh, we needed to move from the world that I just described where no single actor is fully accountable for ending homelessness in their community or can even see the problem whole to the command center model that I described earlier that we're familiar with really in the context of responding to a disaster. Uh, and how do we get all the key actors around the same table sharing the same objectives? Um, and so uh, the next slide, please. Um, uh, also, we realized that would maybe the only thing that could bind uh, a group that was as you know, wide ranging as that list of different actors I shared with you was a shared aim that uh, everyone had to be both seeing the problem in the same way, measuring progress in the same way, and realizing that this North Star of reducing homelessness to a functional zero was the thing that needed to bind all of their efforts. And so uh, moving from a world where um, uh, no one is, is accountable for really anything but their own program goals to a commitment to a shared end state of, of homelessness being rare overall, uh, quickly detected and, and brief when it occurs, that has been the other shift that communities in the Built for Zero movement have adopted. We can go to the next slide, please. Um, key to all this we came to see was having good data. Uh, in, in, in many respects, how you get all of these different collaborators to interact effectively is for everyone to actually see the picture in the same way, to understand what, uh, who, how many people are experiencing homelessness and to be able to see two levels of, of reality at the same time. One person specific data that was, would only be shared of course in privacy protected ways by those who needed to access it to help individuals into housing or to receive the medical or other help they needed. But also the ability of the whole team of different organizations, government and not-for-profit to see what the picture is across the community in real time, like what they were doing that was working, what needed refinement, what should just be ended, like where there were opportunities for progress. Uh, in many respects, you know, we've taken this idea and this practice from the world of global health and also manufacturing, uh, quality improvement practice, that uh, the, the, the use of data for learning and improvement has been, um, I think, quite novel to introduce into a field that has uh, almost always seen data as something that you just need to report or data for judgment, but uh, kind of helping to train communities in 
gathering and using information in this way to actually understand the issue and, and uh, implement new strategies and test and, and, and learn and improve has been uh, an essential part of the pivot. If we go to the next slide, please. One of the other things that having good data, having current data that's comprehensive and accurate can allow communities to do is to invest their resources where the data shows there is the greatest opportunity in the near and in the long term for gains in reducing homelessness. So you're not just guessing anymore. And one of the things that is, is I think, a, a, a very um, uh, important tool that communities have practiced, and that we uh, train communities in the use of is quality improvement. Because if you basically look at a huge influx into homelessness or uh, people returning from uh, homelessness after being housed and, and identify a specific problem that if you can make uh, progress on it could really lower your numbers. Um, using quality improvement is basically a practice for creating a hypothesis and testing it rather than spending a lot of time arguing about uh, ideological you know, uh, approaches, but to just put uh, ideas to the test and learn and improve together. And again, the data is key to this, but it allows communities to put resources where they're going to evidently have the greatest effect and to learn and improve as they go. And then the next slide, please. Um, I wanted to walk you through uh, how the, um, uh, the, some of these practices work and, and get more deeply into kind of these five practices. And the one I didn't mention is uh, the fact that we've knit all these communities together into a learning network so that there is this peer learning opportunity as communities are testing things in one community, they can share what they're learning and help another community adapt it. And so it accelerates the, the, the process, but it also uh, makes, I think, innovation and this shift of practice a little, uh, feel a little safer uh, because all of these groups are doing this voluntarily. They're not necessarily incented to change the way they work by, by any funding sources, but uh, they're showing up because of, of, of the drive to really get to an end state and, and really have the conviction that this is a, a solvable problem. So we can come back to that learning network. But I want to walk you through it with a little bit more detail what these different practices are. So we'll go rather quickly. Uh, Meg, if you could change the slide, please. I wanted to share with you what the key data points are that communities are helped to look at rather than just a flood of information. Community teams are looking at how many individuals are actively homelessness, actively homeless, but who has come into homelessness for the first time during that period, whether it's a week or a month? Uh, that's an opportunity to learn about a certain type of prevention strategy that you can uh, begin to practice. You're also looking at who's returned to homelessness after having been assisted and who's come back onto the radar locally after perhaps having been assisted in the past, but then not having been seen for a period of time, which is a very common phenomenon. Uh, people will attempt to resolve their own homelessness or maybe be in the, the healthcare system. And uh, because of the, the communication gaps, you know, this is a way of really of making sure that everyone is accounted for and that we take the anonymity out of this problem, which is so important to solving it. But also communities are looking at accelerating outflow. How do you increase housing placements? How do you prevent returns from homelessness? And how do you have better information on folks who are uh, attempting to resolve homelessness, their homelessness on their own and, and moving off their radar screen. So this is what the, the kind of the new data conversation looks like. And Meg, if you can go to the next slide. And the other shift is to help communities move from thinking about just how is my program doing and am I hitting my numbers to how's my community doing? And so a lot of this is, is kind of retraining and offering new support in terms of how you look at system shifts, like when Overall, things are improving, not when you know, things just happen to go well one week, but are communities actually moving to a place where they have their arms around this issue and are, are moving to a place where they know what, uh, what it will take to be at a state of permanent equilibrium where you're staying ahead of the problem. And that's what really the end state of, of homelessness looks like, we believe, and is, is being reached by communities. Not that there's never going to be a person who has a housing crisis, but communities can build the capacity to stay ahead of the problem and, and to constantly adapt and, and use the tools they have to stay ahead of the problem. And so um, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to uh, particularly call out the, the degree to which uh, homelessness in, in our country is a racial uh, justice issue. Uh, so disproportionately, Black and Native Americans experience homelessness. And so 
we have embedded and work with our communities uh, a, a racial a, a set of indicators for reaching a racially equitable system. And uh, this was informed by people uh, with lived experience of homelessness, uh, racial uh, uh, justice experts and community leaders. And we help communities measure four things, uh, not just the system outcomes and our, our, uh, our, our, is there an equitable uh, end to homelessness at every state, but also are people uh, of, of color having uh, decision-making roles in the process? You heard me describe how we wouldn't have learned how broken our system was if we weren't talking to people experiencing the problem. And also are our individuals having an experience of being assisted that preserves their dignity? And is the data accurate? And you know, I, I'm, I'm fond of saying there is no equity without good data. You can't tell if you're delivering on this without accurate information. And so this is part of the, uh, the, 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 the job, part of the opportunity of, of um, uh, coming together to reduce homelessness. It is such an actionable racial equity project. And then next slide, please. Uh, I, I spoke to those, those five things. I'll leave you with this, uh, this, this slide, which is the shared measurable aim, uh, the nimble integrated team, uh, the real-time data and feedback loop, uh, the flexible arsenal of, of, of supports so that you can actually match your investments uh, uh, to where they're needed, and this testable menu of strategies, which is represented by this learning network of now 105 communities. So delighted to answer your questions. And uh, uh, again, thank you for bringing your attention to this important issue. Thank you for that presentation, Roseanne, and for being here with us today. I'm so excited to dive into a further discussion on these issues and to really get a, a better picture and better understanding about Functional Zero and the community solutions approach. I did want to just mention to our audience again that there is a question and answer opportunity here. Uh, so if you can use that question and answer box as a way to engage with our conversation, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, so let's dive into some questions, if that's all right with you. Um, I want to I want to start kind of close to where you left off, which is to talk about homelessness as a racial justice issue. Um, community solutions is working with communities to assess the racial equity of their systems and kind of really look at it through that lens. And part of that framework, as you mentioned, is about collecting qualitative data around the experience and lived experiences of those who are being served by these systems. I'm curious if you can expand on why it's important to do that but also to share with us any best practices that you've encountered on how to do that. Um, as an organization that is continually trying to really work with residents and to do similar work, we'd love to hear about what that experience has been like for Community Solutions. Sure, uh, thank you for the question, Lindy. And I'll just call out two uh, dimensions of, of what good looks like at, uh, at the community level. Uh, one is, uh, if you have data that is person specific and comprehensive and accurate and close to real time, you have to be able to disaggregate it by race and to look not just at like, what is like, did we in, in some way that matches our demographics uh, connect uh, people equitably to housing, but there are so many different touch points along the way. Um, did people see the same number of apartments? Did people, uh, have their uh, their situation uh, identified and detected, and in, in, uh, and and were they linked initial to initial help in uh, uh, in the same time frame? Uh, so there are so many different steps in the kind of housing you know response or homelessness response and housing system that we're helping communities disaggregate their data at certain moments, and and also where there is a gap, like what are the uh, initiatives to test, to refine, to close that gap. And the other that I'll call out is, uh, I think is, is emerging as a, a critical practice, is to have an organized group of uh, uh, individuals with lived experience of homelessness uh, representing these racially uh, um, disproportionately affected uh, 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 groups who can be commenting to your strategist how things are actually working for those who are more likely to experience homelessness and more likely to have bad outcomes along the way or, or, or um, uh, to have uh, to spend a longer time in the system uh, awaiting help. Uh, so those are, those are two ways in which communities are, I think, um, uh, entering this work, but then also the qualitative measures about whether people 
a report that their dignity was uh, respected and preserved during the process. Uh, those are that's equally important, and as as well as, are you getting to an end state overall of of um, closer to functional zero? But communities are starting with the ability to disaggregate their data, look at different key moments, and then formalizing the role of people with lived experience. Sounds like that data is really important in helping to ask those questions, but the questions themselves are really about the lived experience. It's exactly. a great combination of, of the two. I want to also thank you for sharing a little bit about your journey overall and how you came to the Built for Zero effort in 2015. But I'm actually wondering if you can kind of make a full circle. I'm curious if you found that this collective approach and shared aim has helped communities like ours who really do deal with a housing shortage, a building issue, um, be able to build more housing because they've been able to come together in that shared aim. If you could just reflect a little bit about kind of the full circle between development and planning. Yeah, yeah that is work that is you know, far from complete, uh, Lindsay, but I'll tell you what some of the promising signs are. Um, we know that you know, even our own experience has taught us that it's the combination of having you know, the right amount of housing and the right type of housing and having a, a, an accountable operating system to actually see that folks who are experiencing housing crises get the help they need to prevent their homelessness or to quickly exit it. With respect to how having an organized team actually is affecting housing supply, the following things have been happening that are really encouraging. Um, one is uh, California is, is uh, I think, a leader in this, but it's happening in many places in terms of uh, state initiatives around uh, supporting the acquisition of hotels, motels, using state property, and just actually looking, having um, uh, uh, you know, practices in place that are, are, are seeking to you know, quickly you know, reuse assets. The other, uh, maybe shorter term, like an exciting thing is happening have to do with how private landlords are being engaged. And it, 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 there is something uh, you know, just unmistakably different about a community when they get to quality data and they can show their landlord community, they can show their housing authority, they can show you know, the, the you know, the city hall or the county, you know, like, here's what our gap is. Because it moves it from this issue that like, who knows, you know, to something that is, even if the number is high, it becomes actionable. Yeah, you know, like here is here's not just how many people are actually experiencing chronically chronic homelessness this week, this month, but here's what the here's here's what the dynamics of this look like and the inflow and the outflow. And it can also begin a process of highlighting what the type of house, the typology gaps are. We see across the country that there's actually kind of a missing form of housing that there are, uh, especially among those experiencing chronic homelessness a lot of uh, increasingly older adults and people with medical needs, not to the degree of needing full nursing care, but that really can't be easily or, or safely met in tr traditional supportive housing that presumes uh, the ability to live independently. It's almost as though we need uh, an assisted living product you know, to uh, account for that, that group of individuals and their needs. We wouldn't have seen that without the data. And so the, you know, there are now conversations, especially in states uh, that uh, have um, a Medicaid waiver that is, is encompassing of different housing supports. And so this is, this is some of the follow on effect that um, you know, with actual information, you see different behaviors emerge and you also see different problems that you know, were, were obscured when everything just looked like, you know, like a, a, a big anonymous issue. We've seen that right here in Contra Costa and Alameda County. So you're really pinpointing things that we're talking about and dealing with very much on the local level here. And I really appreciate that you also brought up landlords. So I want to dive into that a little bit. Bakersfield, California is an example that you often talk about of a city that has essentially reached this functional zero. And part of that has really been helpful through funding, like through organizations through Kaiser Permanente, who supported things like master leasing. Can you talk right. to us a little bit about what that looked like in Bakersfield and how they were able to see success in, in a program like that where other communities have perhaps attempted but have, have struggled or, or run into issues? Right. And that's actually a terrific illustration of where the dynamics of the housing market can be shifted when you have a really high performing, you know, coordinated team with good information. 
uh, what the Bakersfield team was able to do across, actually it was across Kern County, was to get to a point where they, they knew they had really optimized all of their housing assets. And interestingly, this is a team that was largely led um, in terms of the day-to-day -day support of, of the, the coordinated um, kind of command center by someone at the housing authority, which was, you know, a, a really, I'd lift that up as a best practice. It's great when housing authorities step into that kind of powerful role. But they got to a point where they saw sort of what their gap was. And, you know, they needed uh, some additional resources to close that gap and go out and do some master leasing. And, and they, they used all of their vouchers. They used everything that they, they actually at this point had access to. And that's where Kaiser Permanente stepped in. And um, I can't speak for Kaiser Permanente, but I think they were persuaded that, like, not only was this a quantifiable gap, but this, you know, extraordinary company that is putting so much commitment into housing and homelessness. They're like, if we can get a whole county to an end state on chronic homelessness with, with a, a contribution to, to fill that master leasing problem, I, that was, was what the course of, of uh, that product uh, that project looked like. And, uh, you know, they are you know, just an example of the, the kind of tenacity and discipline data-driven work that uh, can be successful, um, even in a, even in a state with, just as everyone acknowledges, like enormous housing development and housing cost challenges. Wonderful. I think that really leads us well into a video question that we have teed up. It has a lot to do with how organizations, Kaiser being a great example, can contribute to this communal effort and this kind of collective aim. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to a video question. Hi, I'm Anna Dorangelo with the Martinez Refining Company, and thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Businesses often engage directly with unhoused individuals, and because of that, can have a unique perspective on their needs. And there are also a lot of businesses that would really like to be able to be part of the solution. So how do you see businesses partnering with the Built for Zero efforts and what role can businesses play in ending chronic homelessness? Well, thank you for the question. And you know, I think this is one of the great um, untapped uh, possibilities of widening these you know, community tables to more explicitly include uh, the business community. Right now, landlords are, are very clearly a critical part of the community team. And interestingly, in many communities, they're not at the table or they're considered, you know, just some somehow this 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 you know entity out there. But you know, the more closely engaged uh, landlords are with their 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 local efforts, you know, things just work better. But we have a few communities that I'd point to like Grand Rapids as one where a lot of the energy around bringing the community together and providing support to the COC to you know, enter into this whole Built for Zero commitment was really coming from the, built for, uh, the, the business community. And you know, they and some local philanthropy said, like, we know we're gonna need to put more resources behind this effort. And I think it was the promise of that it wasn't gonna be the not-for-profit community somehow like, do, committing to all this work, and then like, what do we do when we see there are gaps? Yeah, you know, the business community really made this commitment early on to sort of backstop, you know, what the goal was. Like they were in to support getting the community to functional zero, and we've seen nationally a number of uh, companies have, have collaborated with us and have in some ways kind of adopted certain cities, like uh, Rocket Mortgage uh, in, in Detroit has been uh, an example of both. Um, and not just being a partner to our national work, but uh, one of the challenges in ending veteran homelessness in Detroit is that there are some legacy, what are called grant per diem shelter programs for veterans that um, you know, were, were you know, there's sort of like a program mismatch with actually helping veterans uh, uh, qualify for supportive housing and move into it. And so Rocket Mortgage, uh, you know, put aside funds to help incent veterans in terms of move in and close the gap so that they could take available housing that was permanent. Uh, they've helped to finance the renovation of what was formerly a shelter into new permanent supportive housing. So those are just a few examples, but everything from like being at the table uh, and, and helping to problem solve to uh, helping with 
specific resources to helping secure housing, you know, rallying landlords, to bringing uh, business expertise, to re renovating buildings, uh, you know, a, 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 to, to helping with these incentives to help people move out of homelessness and get uh, uh, stably situated in housing. Um, I'll, I'll say another uh, interesting possibility, and this is uh, a project that Kaiser Permanente is part of with us in uh, Bakersfield and Sacramento and several other healthcare systems are, are participating in, in, in various cities, but um, hospitals, uh, and, and the local uh, COCs, they're often seeing the same people a lot. And yet there hadn't really been any kind of organized mechanism for how healthcare can be a driver of reaching chronic homelessness. And so this initiative that has involved Kaiser Permanente and Sutter and uh, uh, Providence St. Joseph's and Common Spirit Dignity, uh, part of what has been learned is that the capability of businesses to provide data support, to provide convening support, to provide training support. Uh, often, you know, uh, businesses even beyond healthcare have quality improvement expertise or data analytics expertise that can actually power up a community team that uh, may not start off with those, those uh, trained staff. Our team at Community Solutions uh, brings a lot of that training, but it's amazing when someone and people from the business community who have those skills already make themselves available to help the local team. You bring up a question that actually came up in our chat, but that we had also kind of teed up around privacy. And just wondering, as you think about and talk about data sharing and this incredibly important element that data brings, how do you also deal with the legal side of, of the ability to share that data and, and respecting someone's privacy? Is that something that you've encountered and had to Yeah, and address? that's a fun, it's, a, it's a, such an important question. It's a fundamental question. And it's also a question that's been answered. And you know, I think there's often like, a, oh, you yeah, know, but frankly, in just the same way, we're all familiar with how to comply with HIPAA in the healthcare system is like you sign, you know, your releases and, you know, and, and there's a circumscribed number of, of entities that, you know, are, are, are part of that sharing network and the, uh, the limits of the intention of this sharing, you know, are, are clear for, you know, you know you're, you're, you're meeting your health needs. Uh, we have basically developed over the years HIPAA compliant releases that are used in every community that that network of, of actors signs that individuals who are experiencing homelessness uh, agree to the use of their data being shared for the purpose of securing housing. And there are different you have privacy settings. Not everyone at these, all these organizations needs to know anything other than, you know, like what the numbers are. It's only the direct case managers who are working specifically with individuals who would have those open privacy settings and really know what the particular uh, needs of that individual would be. Thank you. That's helpful. And I'm going to pivot us just a little bit because we also had a question come up in the chat about getting local, county, state, federal folks all on the same page. And that's something here in California that's actually being discussed profusely. Our counties have come together to kind of support and suggest some accountability measures to really help outline, like, this is the city's responsibility. This is the county's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that in other states? And what have you seen be successful in that regard? Yeah, this is, uh, I don't know as much as I'd like to about that effort in California. My, yeah, my colleagues who are based in California are very excited about it. But I'll tell you, this is you know, the most promising of, of efforts. Um, what we've come to see is, you know, without what we're, we kind of call stackable civic infrastructure, where you've got the, the city, the county, the state, and the federal government aligned, everything's just a lot harder than it, it should be. Um, uh, you, know, you have, you know, well-meaning efforts that are going in different directions, and, it, it, you know, you end up in that maze that I showed you at, at, the, at the beginning. One of the things that we are seeing as very promising is an effort um, in, uh, in Denver. We've, uh, we've been working, actually Kaiser Permanente was key uh, to that initiative getting underway. I, I have to say it's one of their key markets, but what we uh, have going in uh, the, the Denver area now is the city of Denver um, uh, and, 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 and county, plus six other counties that are part of that uh, continuum of care all with like a, a county you know, city lead who's coordinating locally, plus the state uh, as it, we're working statewide in Colorado. And what that 
allows us to do is to really kind of shift the job of, of many of these entities at the state level, the state team, uh, uh, different agency leads among all of the relevant agencies are now seeing their job as like working as a coordinated team to remove barriers that are being identified by the regional team. So if hypothetically in Denver, it's just like, we have a gap in terms of the use of this resource or this policy is misaligned with what we're trying to achieve. The, the, the state team is now positioned to say, how do we deal with that? So we unblock that, that particular problem that's being experienced in this county. And so that is the absolutely, you know, kind of the, 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 the future vision where everything we're trying to achieve at every level is being positively reinforced. reinforced. And that um, uh, uh, policy decisions are not kind of developed in a vacuum of knowing what is actually true and needed in the local community. That makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate you just broadly bringing up the local community. I'm gonna to go to another video question that I think really hits on as a broad community, how do we engage? Can we tee that up? Hi. I'm Tali Graves, the director of the Chevron Richmond Refinery. Chevron's a large employer and investor in the community. We support workforce development and community groups that are working on the unhoused issue. We feel like we're doing the best we can with what we have, but my question is, are you aware of any creative work going on by other companies or groups that is moving the needle and we should consider to better support our community? Well, uh, so appreciate the question. Uh, the um, I can point to um, well, Kaiser Permanente, uh, Home Depot Foundation, Rocket Mortgage, um, as, as some of the partners that we work with nationally, and who also are, are particularly committed to their home communities. But uh, what they have signed on to are a couple of things: how to help build the infrastructure, this problem solving infrastructure nationally and the, the, the learning network and uh, kind of the policy work that supports advances toward having aligned policy. Um, uh, they are also, many of them investing in directly in housing. Uh, we have uh, ourselves been uh, in, in some of our largest communities helping with uh, the support of social impact investors to acquire existing affordable housing, privately owned affordable housing as it's coming on the market as part of a preservation strategy and linking the units as there's natural turnover to the local coordinated entry effort you know, of, of the local COC. And so if, if you're a company with the capacity to be investing in housing, that is a powerful way to think, not simply uh, buying tax credits, as important as that is, but also, can you be an actor in preserving the housing that exists? Um, that that's something that I think as a country we took our eye off that ball. That you know, like as we're building more affordable housing, you know, more of it is is being you know uh, uh, sold and, and um, uh, uh, rents increased. And so, uh, for for companies that are in the position of being an investor in housing. Uh, this idea of buying and making permanently affordable existing housing might be something to consider. Yeah, we have an organization here in Richmond who is working on that and has kind of expanded some of its its approaches in that way. So it's good to hear that that's something nationally that's part of the conversation. And I appreciate that both of our video questions really had to do with how can we be part of the solution? You know, right. and I think that's exciting to Terrific. see from our business community, from our civic community, throughout the community at large. But we have a great question here from Valley Baroni, who is a, a local leader, asking when these communities do come together, like how were the system teams brought together? So who kind of started that initial work? You had mentioned yeah. the housing authority, but is it a different organization in every community? How, how does that leadership begin? I'm so glad that this question was uh, raised, so thank you. Um, when it comes to who are the key actors? I, I showed you that slide with about 40 different entities. But the key actors everywhere are the COC, which is the you know, consortium of not-for-profits, the mayor's office of your principal city, you know, the county executive, you know, and, and um, the housing authority or authorities, 
And for veteran homelessness, the, uh, the VA, for family homelessness, you know, the critical agencies working with families for you know, youth homelessness, the critical agencies working with youth. But uh, just uh, so focus on like the, the, uh, the big four, which are you know, the COC, the housing authority, uh, the mayor and, and uh, the county executive. Uh, what we have seen happen uh, through the whole experience of Built for Zero is uh, it, it's usually like two of those leaders get together and say, we have seen the problem and it's us. It's the way we're working. They're like, we're going in a million directions. No one has a common strategy. Uh, no one actually knows the dimension of the problem and what's working. And having two of those leaders just say, like, what if we work differently? And, and you know, kind of uh, ideally pull in you know, the other two. Those are, that's the beginning of, of having a new approach. And so when a, com a community joins Built for Zero, there's, uh, they have had to get the buy-in of at least, you know, like two of these entities and, and ideally all, all four. And if you're focused on veteran homelessness, you'll, you'll need to get the, the VA on, on board. And so that's how it begins with folks you know, just realizing that this fragmentation that we all see, that that really is the problem and that there are ways to overcome it. And uh, it, it takes a lot of humility, but I think it's also kind of a relief because everybody knows this is the problem. And I think there's, that there's a practice for just arriving at a shared aim and uh, beginning to work toward a, you know, a measurable end state, even if it's a long road, you know, and, and, and one of our jobs, and I think all of our jobs you know, for, for the business and civic community too, is just to celebrate you know, milestones along the way, because this is not an overnight thing. But if you can get that group of leaders really committing to working differently um, and, and staying with it, um, celebrating each step, that's what begins to turn this, this very complicated issue. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's inspirational to hear, right, that you've seen so many folks come together. And I think we're fortunate here in Contra Costa and Alameda to have really strong councils on homelessness that do bring together a lot of these local leaders. But I also recognize that we have a lot of cities, right? We're in these counties with many cities. And I'm wondering if you've seen or had any examples you can provide of where, you know, counties have really been able to collectively bring together their cities, recognizing that cities have all of their own thoughts, requirements, um, mm -hmm city councils uh, that want to weigh in on this, but that at the same time, it's so important that the city and counties be working together. Absolutely. There's, and you know, getting that alignment down is so critical. And I'll say that it's, um, if you're a county with multiple cities, uh, one of the things that's, that we see playing out is that um, homelessness is, is intensely local. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, I think every city is, you know, uh, needs to have a strategy that is aligned with the counties. It's not, and, and that um, it's not impossible to get there, but every community kind of needs to know like what's actually happening here. And uh, to have that kind of, uh, you know, like uh, iterative uh, uh, um, effort with the, the, the county and the state, as far as like, we're not gonna solve this just as a county, it has to be within each locality. And you know, you'd think oh, this would be really hard, but frankly, that's the way we organize if there's a natural disaster. It's the way you organize like during COVID. It's intensely local, but it's also coordinated. And so that's really the mindset uh, of, of like who needs to be in communication, knowing that the implementation is local, but that the policy and, and other levers, you know, are 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 it's important that they be aligned at the, the, the county and at the uh, state level as well. Hope that's clear enough. It is, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that alignment is not easy, but certainly communication, working in these teams, mm -hmm. I'm sure is hugely yeah. impactful. Um, I just wanted to thank the audience for sending in so many great questions. We're not gonna be able to get to them all, but this has just been a really active audience group. So I wanted to just throw that out there that there's a lot of questions coming in. And I did wanna hit on a few more before we have to end. Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, I do have a question here that has to do with building, and there's actually a few of these, but I'm just going to hit on one. Recognizing the incredible cost to build affordable housing here in California, have you seen any creative solutions to addressing that? We talked a little bit about preservation, which is certainly an important part of that. But what about new build? 
Is there any thoughts that you have about how we encounter this incredible cost issue as it relates to building affordable housing? Uh, well, yeah, it, it really, I think, does lift up you know, the need for just you know, some uh, political courage, frankly. You know, zoning uh, uh, changes. Um, yeah, really, that that is, I think, in California, uh, how to how to balance the interests of many different groups, but keep you know this commitment. Maybe start with the commitment of like, are we going to be a community? Are we going to be a state that allows people to uh, remain homeless or become homeless in the first place? I think. Every state, every city has more levers than they use, you know, from tax policy to land use policy to uh, building codes to environmental regulations to occupancy rules. I mean, you know, subsidy policy, uh, parking regulations. Um, this is really about choices. There's nothing magic. Uh, you know, the, the cost in California and other places is driven by land use policies. and um, we created them as humans, we can change them, you know, but it really is about I think confronting yeah the 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 um, the cost of you know keeping the status quo and the human cost. Um, uh, so nothing magic about it. It's just mustering the political courage to do it. Well, as an advocacy organization, we definitely appreciate that response and and recognize you're absolutely right, the importance of political mm -hmm. courage and and really working collaboratively, which is so much of what Green yeah. Solutions is about. Yeah. Um, I do have one question I want to read. It's a little bit of a longer one, but I'm, I'm hoping that it'll speak to you. This is actually coming from a board member of ours named James Paxson. He says, I'm absolutely inspired by your vision and belief in the ability to solve homelessness as it often feels intractable. Your point about needing to work across sectors and coordinating services is something I believe is crucial. Your discussion about the suggestion that a collective impact approach might be a powerful way to bring this needed collabor collaboration to fruition is powerful. Mm -hmm. This model, however, requires a financial backbone, which can sometimes be elusive and hard to find. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on how folks have been successful in bringing that together. And you've spoken a little bit about this, but I thought it was a little bit more direct and maybe a good way for us yeah. to sort of come to an ending and thinking about yeah. how do we find that, that financial backbone that can help us to bring these groups together? Yeah. Terrific question. Um, what we have typically done uh, across the Built for Zero communities is, you know, the, the question is absolutely right. You need a local backbone. We have tended to begin with like whoever joined Built for Zero, whoever rallied the troops. It could be the county, it could be the housing authority, it could be the, the COC. But to, um, to, to work with that kind of the, the initial organizer, like, all right, how do we create uh, you know, that table? How do we make it someone's dedicated job to be the convener? How do we make it someone's dedicated job to be the data lead. Um, and so we're, we're helping to construct these backbones where, where kind of none existed. Um, I, I think from a govern huge governance issues with COCs all over the country, I mean, some have volunteer boards, some are quite sophisticated, some are embedded in counties, some in city governments. Um, that, that irregularity is, is definitely a challenge. But what is, you know, the true line is you need to create that, that you know, kind of structure and uh, give it, uh, it not a ton of resources, but enough resources so that it's actually someone's job to be doing the coordination, not something that they do for five minutes at the end of the day after they, you know, run the outreach team. And so that is a role, I think, for local philanthropy, the business community. Um, uh, uh, HUD, when they uh, disperse grants to COCs, you know, it's it's really light on the you know the the, the role of the COC as a coordinator. Facilitation. Yeah, just yeah. It, it and and so and as we all know, like facilitation and coordinating others, name a harder job. It's got to be somebody's job, but it doesn't have to be an army. It's just like a dedicated person and some disciplines around meeting, data sharing, case conferencing. You know, um, uh, uh, sort of prioritizing assets, you know, decision making. This it's 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 kind of amazing when you think that, you know, communities are having to do this work as, you know, like a set of workarounds that we're seeing the progress we're seeing. But the business community, the civic community can help support that backbone infrastructure. And uh, 
that actually is a very powerful way to see your community make progress. Yeah, and inspiring when it does occur as you've helped to highlight. So I have one final question and it's about housing and health. So we've seen abundant research about the connection between housing and health, some of which done right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. As an organization focused on measurably ending homelessness, have you encouraged communities to further this research? And if so, how have you seen that help with narrative change? Well, it, it's, um, I don't know that we're so much encouraging the research because you know, there's so many groups that are doing such terrific work there. What we're encouraging is the new partnerships, mm -hmm. uh, you know, supported by you know, the, the, the fine research that, that has been generated. Um, one of the, the key things in, in our healthcare and homelessness pilot uh, that I, I mentioned earlier with the COCs and these hospital systems, getting data sharing agreements in place uh, for these uh, entities has been um, a challenge, but one that they're figuring one that they're figuring out, and that I think is um, a powerful next frontier. Not to know just that last year, so many of the people that we had in the hospital had help had housing problems, but th th today this number of people who are in the, the the hospital need a housing linkage. And how through these new relationships do we make that happen? And so that's where we're moving and, and absolutely think that the role of healthcare as a critical member of a community response to homelessness, to you know, preventing it and, and, and to quickly detecting it and to supporting its uh, um, you know, permanent resolution is absolutely what the future needs to look like. We see so many of, of these partnerships uh, coming into play right now. And I'll, I'll say a third leg to that relationship is not just the homelessness system, and the healthcare system is public health. I think one of the things that um, is uh, necessary and, and maybe took the pandemic for us to realize it, that um, like public health never got invited to the right meetings. Like a lot of the homeless response teams and communities never interacted with public health. Pandemic forced new relationships. And when you think of not just homelessness as a public health issue, but like, how did healthcare and public health get separated? How did homelessness ever kind of become this issue that was you know, like kind of not not connected with with population health and public health strategies? And so those relationships are emerging, and um, uh, I think work that strengthens the implementation capabilities and the partnering capabilities is. Um, uh, an important uh, uh, area of action and something we're deeply engaged. Well, and it sounds like access to that data has helped perhaps shift narratives within those who are even doing this work. I'm curious, do you think it's also going to shift, you know, narratives outside of the folks who are already working within these systems? And if so, have you seen that in your work? It definitely is. Um, it definitely has shifted some sectors views of homelessness. I think in healthcare, um, it's emerging in public health. We definitely, you know, we've been saying for a long time that homelessness is a public health issue. And in fact, it's public health practices, collaboration, data-driven, you know, iteration that, that are making a difference. That is landing, you know, with a, a wider array of, 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 of actors for sure. I think, um, you know, some of the, um, the narrative issues, though, I think really need, we need help moving an understanding of homelessness from it's an individual problem to it's a system problem. I think that is where the, um, the work needs to focus, not just that homelessness is, is a healthcare issue, which it is, or that homelessness is a public health issue, which it is, or that homelessness is a racial justice issue, which it is. But I think you know the 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 challenge, and I'm so eager for for insights and and thoughts here, is to move this understanding that seems to be accepted that it's about individual misfortune when all the evidence points to it's a broken systems problem, mm. and that we can fix. 
Well, what a wonderful and hopeful place to end our conversation. Like there are things that we can do here and there are things that we can fix. And we have all of this great data and research that's gonna help us do this. And part of that is about the great work of Community Solutions. So thank you so much for joining us today, Rosanna. And thank you for our audience for being so engaged. It's been wonderful to read the chat, a little challenging, but wonderful as I've been having this conversation. I'm gonna hand it right back over to you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. And, and thank you, Roseanne. Uh, homelessness is a complex issue, but one that we cannot let the complexity stand in the way of advancing policies and partnerships um, that help, as Roseanne said, identify solutions, not just reactions. Um, there's certainly nothing magic here, as you said, and it's really about choices. And I'm, I'm hopeful for the future, uh, not only because of the committed leaders in our region, uh, but visionaries like Roseanne and her team. So thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to get involved with the East Bay Leadership Council's work, please reach out. All employees of EBLC member organizations can engage with our task forces. And since you already subscribed to the newsletter, which I know you did earlier, uh, you will always have the latest news from our team. So please stay involved. We are a stronger organization with all of you at the table. And um, with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>